Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Heather Cummins. I'm the Gallery Programs Coordinator here at the Bell Museum. Well, I'm in my home today, but at the Bell Museum. And uh, I'd like to begin this experience by acknowledging the Dakota people, um, the indigenous keepers of the land on which the Bell Museum sits. That land is Dakota land. It was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux that was signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to the Dakota today. I would also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, indigenous inhabitants of the lands to the north. Indigenous knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing the land now called Minnesota. And at the Bell, we are committed to honoring and supporting that knowledge, the values embedded in it and the people who keep it. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Josh Winkler, a Bell Museum resident artist to present his work. Josh is an associate professor of printmaking at Minnesota State University in Mankato. He uses a range of drawing, printmaking, and sculptural processes to build layered landscape narratives that ask viewers to consider the social, political, and environmental contexts of their surroundings. He worked with the Bell over the summer on a project called Connecting to Minnesota's Forests Past, Present, Future. The project examined interconnection with ecosystems, communities, and families, giving special attention to hidden connections we can find everywhere from beaver meadows in the North Woods to concrete rich urban landscapes. Josh is going to share some of that work with us today. So Josh, without further ado, thank you so much for being with, here with us today. Um, I wanna ask if there's anything that you would like to mention before we get started with your presentation. Um, I'll just say that I, I actually pre-recorded the talk. So it, it goes through much of the work that I made at the residency. Um, there's a few pieces that didn't, didn't fit into the talk, but um, you know, you can find links uh, through the bell and potentially this, this live stream to see more stuff. So yeah, and hopefully at the end, we have a few questions from the audience. Great, thank you. Um, so I also wanna let folks know that Amber Kastner is indeed with us today. She's who you are often seeing on these lives. She just has a lot more technology to wrangle today. So she's gonna be working with the video and managing the chat for us today. So feel free to give her a little wave uh, while you watch this next uh, video from Josh. Hi, my name is Josh. I am an artist and educator uh, in Southern Minnesota. I live in rural Nicolet County between Mankato and St. Peter. Um, the image that you're seeing on the screen right now is actually this trail that I hike into a county park right by a property um, on a really regular basis. And this place, you know, had, had a big impact for the work made in this residency. So I've got a lot to show you. I'm not gonna show you everything I made because I'm really limited on time, um, but I'm gonna go kind of quick and show you as much as I can. So I'm gonna start with an artist statement. Um, as an artist, direct experience and research feed the content and connections that are important to me. The environmental and cultural tragedies of the past provide an emotive way to engage the high stakes of the present. As we seek new sources of energy and make decisions about land use, it's critical that we have tangible connections to the land and also understand what has already been lost. My work encourages people to think deeply about their relationship to the environment, local histories, and the present moment. Now, I believe nature is a cultural force that has the potential to foster unity. The planet is really the one thing that we all share. Um, and as we move forward and, you know, face all these challenges that are upon us, I hope that we can, you know, find some unity um, in environmental issues. And yes, I'm being pretty optimistic. Okay, so I'm going to show some photographic images that relate to the work as I go forward. Um, in preparation for this residency in the late fall of 2019, I did a 100 mile hike on the Superior Trail to kind of ground myself and, you know, develop ideas. Living outside for an extended amount of time has always been, you know, a, a, a really kind of a profound experience for me and a way for me to internalize, you know, what it, what it means or feels like to be human. Um, so it's really fun for me to get up there and hike and, you know, think about the residency. Each time I walk a footpath, whether stamped in the snow between parking lots, a deer trail and tall grass, or an extended hike for months in the woods, I find magic and metaphor in the collective path. 
started by one then maintained through collective use, the walking path is a living history between past and present and a thriving link between species. Yeah, I think a lot about the pace at which um, we travel through the landscape. If we're traveling by foot, by car, by plane, um, you know, canoeing, um, you know, how, how does that pace at which we pass through the land connect us to that place or, or not connect us to that place? You know, I think I think that if, if we were able to slow down more, I think there's a lot of potential for us to, um, you know, be healthier and to, um, you know, to connect to the land in a way that would, um, you know, protect it more, the land that sustains us. So the first project I'm going to show you is this um, Everything We Touch Aaron project. <clears throat> and this is on the Bell's ground. This, this image was taken in the early summer when I installed it. Cairns are constructed collectively, sometimes over vast periods of time. One person lays a stone, eventually you have a pile. There's something sacred about this ritual that extends beyond their differences. Stone cairns have been used to mark funereal sites, monuments, navigation routes. I first encountered them marking a trail above tree line in New Hampshire's White Mountains in 2006. Another surprise in the White Mountains was a parking lot atop the highest peak. After hiking a few days towards Mount Washington summit, I found carloads of people, bathrooms, concessions, and a post office. Following stone cairns to a summit parking lot at 7,000 feet, as I moved forward, they became less sacred and more like concrete. So I used this material of concrete, this industrial material. Um, I also cast one out of cast iron, um, just to kind of talk about that notion of everywhere we go, we bring concrete. Um, that's why the, the project's called Everything We Touch. Um, you know, I was also thinking about, you know, the story of King Midas and how everything he touches turns to gold and the implications of that. Um, so, yeah, the concrete was a way to, you know, talk about how we take things that may be sacred and, and transition them to being profane. So that's why I wanted to use this material. And so I made these molds from granite rocks that I found near my house and then cast multiples out of concrete. And then again, I went to this casting workshop in March in Tucumcari, New Mexico, right at the, right as the pandemic started basically. And I was able to cast these stones and get home before it really took hold. Um, but here's some of the iron that I casted there. And so back to the Spear hiking trail, um, another element of the project, um, I would say an element of hope is, uh, colonies of lichen and mosses that are eventually applied to the stones to um, kind of take back the built environment. Um, at this point, it's more conceptual than uh, physical. I mean, it's starting to happen, um, which is exciting. So, you know, lichen and moss, the more I learn about these organisms, the more interesting they become aesthetically, conceptually, you know, I'm fascinated with their experience of time, um, their persistence in harsh environments. Um, I've also been reading about the symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi that unite to form lichen. Um, you know, uh, algae can photosynthesize and produce energy or sugar and lichen, or I'm sorry, fungi can um, actually break down or extract minerals from something like these granite rocks that I saw on the Superior Hiking Trail. Um, and then together they can kind of grow and share. Um, so I, I think that's endlessly fascinating. And then the, the other layer of them being able to kind of break down the built environment after we're gone, and I find that kind of inspiring. Um, after hiking the trail, the bell put me in contact with uh, an ecology professor at the U that specializes in lichen and bryophytes, Daniel Stanton. And talking to Daniel, I learned quite a bit more about lichen and how I might cultivate new colonies of lichen and moss for this project. So, you know, Dan, one of the things Daniel suggested was gathering um, lichen from surfaces uh, like concrete and steel, the surfaces that I would be applying them to. So I, I did that. Um, like this image here is a Kentucky Fried Chicken parking lot that's abandoned. This is a county park bridge rail that's steel. So just kind of what I had nearby. I also gathered from, from my aluminum gutters and asphalt shingles. And so the gathered lichen, I made these slurries that could be painted onto the rock so the spores could potentially, you know, recolonize the forms. And the image on the right, um, you can see that there is something starting to grow there. And Daniel suggested that this is a cyanobacteria that's probably a good sign for conditions that lichen might, might grow. So another project, um, this is a big woodcut print, and it's a two-sided print. Uh, I hand wax these big sheets of paper so that you could see elements of the other side when looking at one side, encouraging the viewer to kind of move around the, the project. 
So I'll read the statement for this one. Um, Visiting a small patch of remaining old growth, it's easy to imagine how the vast white pine ecosystems of Minnesota once rivaled the complex drama of any old growth forest. They were an infinite resource. They were a cultural resource. As these great forests brought wealth to settler communities at the turn of the century, indigenous peoples watched the great rivers carry their homeland to the sawmill in less than 15 years. The late great pine forest renders a thriving old growth forest in northern Minnesota before logging efforts wipe the forest clean. The image combines individual survivors from the few small patches of old growth that remain today. A grove in the Superior National Forest inland from two harbors, a grove along the Arrowhead Trail near McFarland Lake, a scattering of trees along the Gunfront Trail, the Lost Forty, and several trees along the Superior Hiking Trail. The other side of this print, Death by a Billion Cuts, was generated from several log jam photographs from the Minnesota State Archives. The first significant sawmill in Minnesota was in Stillwater, and one of the biggest log jams in the history of the country happened here as all that white pine lumber floated down the St. Croix River to the mill. And so here's the two prints separate so you can really see them individually. Here are the blocks. You can see how I'm drawing on them with graphite, carving, drawing more, reacting. Here is a proof of the late great pine forests in our studio here. And then some source images. Um, This is the grove inland from two harbors. uh, It's a a small small grove of old growth white pines. Here's an image of this grove way up north on the arrowhead. And then these are some images from the Minnesota State Archives of these log jams that I kind of compiled to build the image. And this is the print hanging at the bell. It was really the perfect space to put it. Um, In this window, it's illuminated by the light. You can kind of peek around both sides. And even during the pandemic, you can can view one side of the print from outside. So I really like that aspect of it. Uh, This is another shot from the bell. And in addition to that big woodcut, you can see a video projected on the wall. During the pandemic, um, I made a series of eight meditation videos where I'm just kind of out in the landscape. Um, you know, breathing and, and looking at my surroundings. Um, and they were released on, on the Bell's website and social media. And this one's um, this grove of black ash in Malacca County. So that gives you a gist of what the videos are like, but I need to keep moving. Um, Another project about wetlands and beavers. Um, So I'll read the statement for this one. Wetlands, beaver dams, beaver hats in the past. Keeping fresh water on the land is a good plan for the climate. This image was generated from a combination of experiences exploring wetland beaver habitat along the Minnesota River and the Spear Hiking Trail while reading about beavers and their North American story. With vast populations, likely over 100 million before Euro-American settlement, to near extinction around 1900, to around 6 to 12 million today, these complex rodents have been revered in indigenous creation stories, killed in mass for their hat-producing pelts, and recently introduced into depleted landscapes to restore wetlands, slow erosion, irrigate crops, and rebuild habitat for a numerous species, from songbird to trout. This is an image from the Superior Hiking Trail. And again, I've explored a lot of beaver habitat where I, near I live during the length of this residency. So here's a studio shot of mixing color inks for this project. Another project, uh, these connection prints were conceived in the pandemic springtime, one of those moments where everything was just right despite our human reality. The morning sun raking the forest floor, turkeys gurgling nearby, morels poking through the leaves, the forest miraculously starting up again. I was also thinking about the economy of the forest, the fungal network sharing nutrients below ground, collaborations between species, and the complexity of interaction around us that we can only begin to glimpse. Plants and fungi have been growing and knowing for hundreds of millions of years before us. We evolved in their world, a world that has nourished us. How can we protect it, reforest it, reflood it, release it from our grasp a little? Here's a shot of some of this work installed at the Bell. And then lastly, I want to finish with this uh, geocache project. I wanted to do a project where I could get work out into the world and accessible to really anybody that was willing to go out and hunt for it. Um, So I I printed an edition of 60 prints by hand. um, And then I set up 
two GL cache sites in Nicolet County, and then and then one actually at the Bell, where people could come and get these prints for free, and then have some kind of like memory that's tied to their relationship out in the woods or outside. Uh, if anyone wants to see more on my blog, I've written kind of extensively. This is through my website about each one of these projects. So you're welcome to check that out. And then lastly, I just want to give out some thank yous while playing a short video of me printing the final layer of that geocache project. So thanks to Jennifer Stamp, of course, at the Bell for all her work and support for this project. Daniel Stanton at the U.S. College of Biological Sciences. Um, Seller Press, which is the space that I'm printing in right here, and Anne Makepeace at the Grand Center for Arts and Culture. My good friend Yusuf Del Valle um, for all the work, or all the help casting and making molds. And then, of course, the Bell Museum and the McKnight Foundation for making the work possible. So with that, I hope there's a little bit of time for questions, and thanks for listening. See ya. Well, thank you for that, Josh. Um, I know it can be really hard to squish things that we love so much into a tiny 10 or 15 minute slot. Um, so thank you for putting it all in there so nicely. And I hope those of you watching um, got a really nice feel and sense for the just incredibly diverse type of work that Josh can do um, or is doing. And I also want to make a note that Jenny Stamp is very sorry that uh, she could not be here with us today. Um, but she has been so excited for this work and um, has really loved working with Josh as a partner through this project. Um, and she wanted me to say especially that she's very pleased with how this project grappled with the pandemic. And it gave us some ways to think about caring for ourselves, one another, and the planet. Um, so Josh, let's move into some questions. I have one I'd like to start us off with. Um, you mentioned that one of the things that you wanted to explore with this project is how people are connecting with nature or perhaps are unable to connect with nature. Um, and I wonder if there's anything that you've learned through this process that you might be able to share with us. Um, or maybe if you have some tried and true tips on um, ways mm -hmm. can really engage with nature, especially during um, such a challenging and stressful time. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can mostly speak to, you know, my own experience of what's nearby me. Um, and maybe that is the tip. Um, you know, like, I was lucky enough to go up north before the pandemic and, you know, see these monumental uh, landscapes up there. But you know, the more I explored the the lands close to home, the more I just kind of realized that, you know, we, we really need to just kind of meet our landscape places where they're at and appreciate whatever is close to us. Cause you can really get so much out of, you know, a, just a little patch of, you know, property, whether it's wild or just place where things are growing. So um, I will say, and this probably happened in the cities too. Um, the County park near where I live, when the pandemic hit, it just became flooded with people like enormous amounts of people. And, you know, I was used to it being almost like a private <laughs> space. Um, and so I thought a lot about that. And I, I mean, ultimately, you know, there was stress on the park because the increased amount of people, they made more parking spots, brought in port porta toilets, and it, it really changed things. Um, and, you know, maybe there's even some more garbage left behind and stuff. But just the fact that there's more people there um, is, is so important, I think. Um, you know, just uh, the more people that that are having personal connections, tangible connections, the better, I think. So, um, and maybe the more people that start to go to these public spaces, um, you know, the more of them we can actually create. Thank you. Yeah. And I love that idea that you put out of, you know, what's near you. And, and I think so often we kind of get stuck on this idea that nature is this other thing that's over there and we have to go to it. Um, but so much of it is right outside our doorsteps, even if a lot of what's outside our doorstep are, you know, concrete sidewalks and things like that. The cracks are overflowing oftentimes with ants and moss and all kinds of other little microcosms. So I love that idea that uh, it's, it's all around us. So step outside and take a look. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, are there any questions in the chat that we want to uh, give some time to before we move on to other questions here? 
Uh, I haven't seen any questions directly, but lots of comments and, and lots of thank yous and um, and support and, and admiration of your prints and of your work. Um, Daniel, who you mentioned, you mentioned you'd worked pretty closely with, um, did hop on and, and made some notes about thank you for the presentation on lichens um, and mosses. He did also mention that um, the dry end to the summer had has kind of changed that that ecosystem on, on the cairns, um, but that he's optimistic that there will be more regrowth and recovery this spring. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. It's good to hear that there's still hope. <laughs> um, Josh, there's a, another thing um, that I want to talk with you about, um, and that's this, the geocaching project. Um, that was so much fun to work with you on getting set up, and I have had the wonderful privilege of tracking on the back end the comments from folks who are visiting that, checking in on the logbook that's physically in the cache at the Bell Museum, and we've had so many people. It's only been up for about a month, um, and they've really loved the idea of going to the landscape of the bell, it actually introduced a lot of people to the bell for the first time. They didn't know it was there. They didn't know the landscape was open and accessible. Um, and then also people just really loving access to the, the prints that you stocked the cash with. Um, and I will let folks know too, that if you haven't had a chance to uh, sort of do the search and find on the bell landscape for Josh's cash there, um, we have information about that up on our website. And then if you just go visit the Bell Museum landscape, which is open, even though the museum building itself is not open right now, um, there's a sign right by the front entry that will walk you through the process of um, getting the clues that you need to go find the cache. And it is has been restocked with coloring sheets of Josh's print. Um, it was a limited run of the prints themselves, but we're super excited to be able to offer the, the coloring sheet version of it so that you can kind of maybe take your own experiences and add your own colors and things like that to this really beautiful piece by Josh. Um, and Josh, I'm wondering, since you had cache sites other than the bell, um, if you got any good feedback there, um, or if you maybe gained some more insights into this idea that you mentioned in your recording about wanting to increase and improve access to art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like the coolest thing, I, I mean, what I wanted to do was, you know, have people that aren't, you know, my friends or, you know, people in the art sphere in my social media channels or whatever actually find this work. Um, and, you know, I would love to figure out ways to do that more. But just registering uh, the site in Nicolette County through geocache.com. Um, you know, those, those people that are geocachers, um, it's just a very diverse body of people like you. Um, definitely people I don't know or don't have experiences with. And I don't know, I just, they, they, they're leaving notes in my logbook. And so I just find that really exciting um, to just get different perspectives. Um, you know, I'm bringing the work out of the gallery. Um, I feel like sometimes my work functions well as a body because my arguments um, are strengthened between pieces. So one of the challenges for me going forward is I do wanna make more works that are accessible out in the world um, and figure out ways to make my points, um, you know, in, the, in these little moments. And so that's one of the things I'm trying to think about going forward for the art to have some kind of like um, positive action tied to it instead of just, you know, being on the wall and something I did. Yeah, that's great. I love that kind of take it a step further idea of trying to connect the, the art with action. And that makes me think a little bit too about something else that you mentioned um, in your video about these elements of hope. And I'm wondering if there are any pieces from this project, your, your Bell residency that have really stuck with you and continued to kind of grow and flourish as inspiration points or, or if there are new ones that you are getting excited about um, that can kind of influence the art that you'll be doing down the line with the Bell or otherwise. And um, if there might be something that you'd be interested in sharing with folks is even just ways to kind of start looking at the world around them to, to seek out those little elements of hope. Yeah, um, honestly, most of my work has more conflict in it than the work that I made at the Bell. 
Um, it really is more about just like personal connection and the, the intimacy of that um, and how powerful that is. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I might do more stuff like that. One thing that happened with the videos that I made, the meditation videos um, that I didn't really expect was, you know, I, I, I honestly feel like, you know, we're myself included, I, I'm using a screen too often. Um, and it was really funny and ironic that, uh, you know, even these videos are like 30 seconds long and just pausing and holding the camera and recording something for 30 seconds and just really focusing on what I was recording and the subtle movement. Um, I was just really struck at how, how much I felt like I was just pausing and connecting, even though it was filtered through this technology. Um, so it, it was like, you know, a serious reflection happening through this technology. So, I mean, that might be th something for people to try, um, you know, if, if they, if they want to take their phones outside and do some recordings, um, just you're, you're breathing, you're pausing, you're focusing on one thing because you want to keep the camera steady. Um, just kind of surprising to me. Um, so I thought that was really effective. Yeah, and I, I like the idea, too, that uh, technology can be a tool there to help us disconnect from it, <laughs> which, you know, right. doesn't necessarily make sense right away. Um, but, yeah, using it to kind of force us to slow our pace, something else that you mentioned, like slowing down, being in the moment. Um, I love that. Amber, is there anything else coming through on your end? Yeah, I did. I did want to stop in with just one question, and and I think this is something that is actually we can actually accomplish at the Bell. We have an audience member that had mentioned that they themselves don't do geocaching because they use a walker, um, and they're wondering if there are geocaching sites that you know of where um, that might be a little bit more accessible. Um, I I don't personally. Um, I mean, like you said, the one at the Bell might might be a possibility. Um, and that is a very good question. Um, you know, I, I think I think it would be great to have a geocache planted, you know, in a in an urban environment or an environment that's not um, necessarily the forest. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. That's something that I should think about because I, I do like that that notion. Um, and I think that's important. So great question. And Can I can add more? to that the geocache website. I'm blanking now if it's geocache.com or geocache.org. <laughs> um, they do have indicators on the caches regarding accessibility. Um, so I would say, you know, absolutely check there. There are a lot that are um, accessible with walkers, with wheelchairs, strollers. Um, they'll, they'll have all of those different kinds of things indicated um, based on the location and the information that the cache owner has been able to provide. Um, so they definitely do exist. I don't know of any locations specifically, um, but I know they're around. And that's part of the fun is finding the, the spot that you can get to. Awesome. Um, any last things, Amber? Or are we okay in the chat? Okay. Well, we are pretty much out of time. And I, Josh, want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, for all of your work that you put in at the Bell as well. Um, you really brought a tremendous amount of beauty to the space inside and out. Um, those of you who are here with us um, live or catching us on the replay, I hope that you will stop by the learning landscape at the Bell. Like I mentioned, that's open all the time, even though the building itself can't be open right now. Um, so I hope you'll stop by and go find Josh's Cairn, um, try your hand at the geocache and, and check out some of the other things on the landscape there. Um, it's, it's a really fun spot. And Josh, I hope we can have you back in warmer months <laughs> to hopefully talk with Professor Daniel Stanton and uh, you two can, you know, kind of have a, a moment about lichen and, and what might be happening with the Cairn as the seasons change again, um, seeing how everything we touch, how that installation has kind of evolved and, and maybe changed. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to the McKnight Foundation whose funding helps make the Bell's Resident Artist Research Project possible. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for spending some time with us and um, hopefully we'll see you around the landscape. And thanks again, Josh. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>